So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke 15, uh, verse 11 through 24. And it's a little bit longer of a scripture. I'm going to read it. And it's about the prodigal son. Verse 11 says this. Then he, or Jesus, said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. It's Luke 15, right? Yes. Okay, I heard a lot of pages still going, so I'll just make sure. Um, and not many days afar, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine or pigs. And he would gladly fill his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, yes. and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost, now he is found. And they began to be merry. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here with these precious people. I ask that you would bless this time. I ask, Lord, that you would continue to move in this service. I thank you that your anointing's here. I need it as I preach these next few moments. Lord, would you anoint me? Would you anoint our ears and our eyes to spiritually hear and to see what you have to say to us today, Lord? May this message not be just another message, Lord. As I think what Pastor Luke had said, may we preach when we get up as preachers like it may be the last message our child may ever hear, like it may be the last message that someone that desperately needs you ever hears, Lord. May there be an urgency in the way that I preach, but an urgency in our hearts as we take this message and apply it to our lives. And I just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. I thank you that you redeemed us and you've changed us and transformed us and you've pulled us out of places where we sometimes dare not even want to think back upon, but then you use our testimony to transform others. And I thank you that I can share part of mine today. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And all the church said, Amen. 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 Who knows what the word prodigal means? Anyone? It means wasteful. Husbands, would you look at your wife and tell them to stop being a prodigal spender? <laughs> I'm just joking. Don't do that. Some of you women need to look at your husbands and say that, right? They're the ones that are spending all the money. But prodigal means wasteful. It's spending money and resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant, you could say that. This story could also be known as the parable of the loving father, right? Because it emphasizes the graciousness of the father more than the sinfulness of the son. Yeah. You know, we, we oftentimes we think about the son that went and had everything he could have at home, and he spent it, and he came back, and it's a good thing the father was so merciful, well, if we need to focus on why the son got where he got, but I'm going to tell you that we need to understand, and, and this is really where I'm going to go, is how gracious the father is. And this story is so important to understanding the father's love, but also how we should operate when we see others that are struggling. You know, it was the memory of the father's goodness that brought that boy to repentance and forgiveness, right? He didn't think back about the times that he got a whooping and said, oh, I can't wait to get back home. He was thinking about the goodness of his father. So the first thing I really want to talk about is his rebellion. Do you understand that him taking, him taking his inheritance, that was completely legal. It was under the law. He had every right as one of his children to say, I would like my inheritance now. And he could have spent it any which way he wanted. 
So it wasn't technically sinful or technically wrong, but sometimes the devil trips up, uh, trips up, trips up what I'm saying, right? Trips us up that way, doesn't he, right? It, it may not necessarily be a sin, right? It, it's not unlawful, but is it expedient? Is it, is it permissible? Is it good? We have to look at all those things because sometimes we partake in something where we say it's not really a sin, but it's leading us on a bad path. See, the problem was, is he wasn't saying, let me take my inheritance. I want to go buy another piece of land and prove myself. He had something in his heart. He wanted what was his, and he wanted to do with it what he wanted to do, and he wanted to live his life, life the way that he wanted to live it, yeah. right? His heart was wrong from the beginning. He wanted what the world could offer him. And just by living at home, he wasn't going to be able to get out there in the big city and taste all that the world had to offer him. So he wanted more. He wanted to make it on his own. He wanted to enjoy all that the world says it has to give him. But I want to tell you this. A covetous person can never be satisfied. Not once. No matter how much he acquires, and a dissatisfied heart leads to a disappointed life. You know, one of the scriptures that is so crucial for me and I think should be for all of us is godliness with contentment is great gain. Yeah. That doesn't mean we don't want more for our family. It doesn't mean that we don't want more in the kingdom. It doesn't mean that we don't want to see God just move in a great way. We desire those things. I can look at someone that's doing well and say, boy, I would like to live a life that exemplifies that way because I see them following Christ. I see God blessing them. Like, I want that, but I don't want to take their life, right? I don't want to covet something that I haven't worked for, God hasn't given me. If I'm always walking around, if you're always walking around, you're dissatisfied thinking, oh, this kind of stinks, and oh, there's so much more, and you don't learn how to live in God's goodness during that season, I'm telling you, when you get to that next season, there will still be an emptiness in your heart. There's nothing that will completely satisfy you but Christ, amen? So, godliness with contentment is great gain. So we see his rebellion. And then we see that he's going to go to a far country. Now, far country isn't always a distance, right? I've I've met a lot of people when I was in college that they went away from their parents because they just didn't want to be close. They wanted to go and enjoy their life and do those things. And and that's fine. I'm not saying that that's wrong. But sometimes when we think about going to a far country, we think about a distant place. But I'll tell you what, I was 10 minutes away from where I grew up, and I was living in a far country when I was on drugs. You know what I mean? Your heart is just distant from God. Your heart is distant from what he has for you. But when he went out there, it wasn't what he expected, was it? His resources ran out, his friends left him, and famine came. Anyone that's been totally engrossed in sin knows that that's the process once you start heading down that path. You've seen it with loved ones. If you haven't been there yourself, they've made choices and and they think everything's good and they're enjoying it for a second, but all of a sudden their friends don't want to be around them, right? They, They stop having the money that they need and stop having peace in their heart. Well, here's the worst part for him is that he left his father's house because he didn't want to work for him, but guess what? He's working for someone else in that far country. Sin will always get you working for the devil, yeah. one way or the other. That's, right. That's the problem. We think that running away from, from, from the goodness of something because we want to make it our own is it's just something that we're entitled to a lot of times. And we miss that God has something so good in his house for us. Right. Amen? Amen? This shows us what sin really does in the lives that reject the Father's will. Number one, sin, sin promises freedom, but it only brings uh, slavery. John 8, 34 says, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a what to sin? Slave, Slave, servant to sin. Second thing is, sin promises success and happiness, but it brings failure every time. The third thing is, it promises life. Oh, you're going to live a good life. You're going to get to enjoy it, but it brings death. I remember when I was in my sin really bad for a long time, I really was getting frustrated at God. Like, I knew about God, I grew up with God, I loved God, I can't say I was born again, but God and my mom would not leave me alone in my sin. (laughs) I was really frustrated, and there was a point where I just told my mom to stop calling me. My mom is the sweetest lady you'll ever meet. I said, please stop. I actually told her, stop paying my credit card bills, stop paying this and that, like, leave me alone, because she was enabling me. And that, that wasn't my issue. The issue was she kept checking on me and telling me how I needed to get back to God, how I needed to come back home. But, but the worst than that was God's conviction in my heart. Yeah. I couldn't enjoy my sin. Right. I tried. 
I mean, I would for a minute when I was like super high, but then like the consequences of all of that was going on in this conviction in my heart. And I said, God, would you leave me alone? I don't want you anymore. We could talk about one saved, always saved. We could get in a whole big debate. But I will tell you that I didn't feel conviction for three months. I didn't feel anything for three months. It's like God said, okay, son, I'm going to let you fall. I'm going to let you fall real hard. And boy, I enjoyed my sin for the first time in a long time. But it took the toll like I never would have imagined. And it brought me to the end of myself. And just like the prodigal son, I found myself, I have nowhere to go. I have nowhere to live. I have no more money. I've burned all my bridges. And I either got to get something right with God, or I'm going to die or be put in jail. And I'm glad that God let me alone that way. Of course, he never completely left me. But boy, he was going to let me experience the fullness of it. He gave me over to my reprobate mind. He let me wallow in my sin. And when I came to, I realized that I had to start making things right. Now, there's still going to be a process I had to walk towards and walk through. But I want to tell you that I thought that I was going to have the life I always wanted. And it did nothing but bring death. Because what are the wages of sin? Death. Every single time. See, this boy here, he's the prodigal son. He went there thinking he would find himself, but he only lost himself. And you may say, well, I'm in church, Pastor. I, I, you know, I'm, I went through all of that. I'm getting to you next. Yeah. But maybe some of you are still struggling and you're running. Yeah. And you're not out there in those fields eating or watching the swine and being jealous of what they're eating, but you're on your way. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, God wants you to turn before you find yourself at the end, because you're not always going to guarantee that you're going to make it all the way back. I know plenty of people who, who love God. They went out into the world. Boy, if they were guaranteed another chance, they would take it, but they died in their sin. I don't know if they're saved or not. I know people that rejected God. They would stick a finger up to God, tell him he doesn't exist, or, or curse him out. But there are people who love God that just were stressed in their sin, and they died there. We always want to make it right when we can. So he comes to himself, okay? He's awoken to his fallen and depraved state. He is wallowing in his sin. He has nothing anymore. He is looking at the pigs, which are absolutely detestable to Jews. In the Jewish culture, pigs are bad, right? And here he is feeding those pigs, and he is envying the pigs. He's like, I wish that I could eat what they're eating. And he has this moment where he has to make a clear decision, he, he has to repent. Now, repent means to change one's mind, right? Or, or to turn around and start going in the other way. And I want to read this from a, a commentary, because I think this explains it so good, because a lot of people feel bad when they sin, right? Yeah. I mean, every time that I sin, I feel bad. Sometimes it's worldly remorse, and there's no problem with, you know, there should be some consequences. If I get angry and I argue with my wife and I, and I hurt her emotionally, I mean, I should feel bad, right? Yeah. But more than that, I should want to repent before God because I sinned before him. I turn away from those things. I'm already forgiven, but he doesn't want us to continue in that state of acting that way. He, he desires for us to turn away from that. But there's a difference from feeling the worldly sorrow and actually living out godly repentance, turning around and making a difference in that situation. His painful circumstances helped him to see his father in a new way, and this brought hope. If his father was so good to the servants, maybe he would be willing to forgive a son. Had he stopped there, though, okay, the boy would have experienced only regret and remorse. But true repentance involves the will as well as the mind and the motions. He said, I will arise, I will go, and I will say. How many times do we just sit there and we're like, oh. But we don't take the steps that we need to to repent from that. And I'm not saying every time you sin you have to go through this long process because I just want to let you know if you're in Christ, if you've been forgiven, you've been redeemed, he's covered your past, your present, and your future sins. But he doesn't want you to live in your sin. And he wants you to walk in the freedom. He died, Jesus died for you so you could have freedom and have victory over that sin, right? That's where he desires you to go. But if you just sit there like, oh, I messed up again. Oh, I messed up again. And you don't take the steps to get yourself right with Christ. Yeah. If you don't ask him and sh- to show you how to walk with him in those different ways, you're going to just stay there in that place. Amen. So our resolutions may be noble, but unless we act on them, we can never of them, or they can never of themselves bring any permanent good. 
So I just wanted to share that, that piece, that true repentance equals faith in action. And this is kind of where I want to get to. And, and this is really important. And I, and I kind of prayed some of this over the kids as we were praying earlier. What happened when the sun came? Like, let me ask you, how would you come back to the house? You think you'd be whistling, skipping? You think you'd have a big smile on your face? Who wants to be the prodigal son? Well, I mean, not really a prodigal son. Like, who wants to play a prodigal son right now? Yeah. <laughs> Go to the doors over there. I was thinking that. Fire. Let's say you got of age and you took everything that your father, your father has this great opportunity for you to serve in the church and to work with him and to do really well. And you say, Dad, I, I want my inheritance. I don't really want this lifestyle. And you took it and you squandered it. And, and it's been several years. And you find yourself that you have nothing to eat and you're hungry. Would you be smiling if you're hungry? No, not me at all. I know that. So if you hadn't seen your dad in a few years and you were completely embarrassed by all of your actions, how do you think you would walk through that door? Okay, that's good. Stay there. So I'm going to have to use you as the, the father. Now, if we didn't know this story, I'm going to tell you that for the most part, if you know... See, here's the thing. When he comes back home... That his father has every right under Old Testament law to take him in front of the elders and have him stoned to death. Because he shamed the family. He embarrassed the family. He did something so sinfully wrong and it had such a mark on the family. And so when he's coming home, he has to realize this, that he may be coming home and asking for mercy and forgiveness, but he also may die. He may also lose his life. It was that bad that he's coming back and risking that. And so he's coming back in this shameful state of mind. And, and all of a sudden, someone sees him from afar. And, and, and the father's sitting there, and the father looks. Now, I don't know what type of dad you had growing up, but I can think about how my dad looks at me when he was full of shame, or when, when, when he would see the shame in my life, and he would just be embarrassed. But this isn't what happened in this story. See, the father saw him, and all of a sudden, he did something that was really weird and really strange in the Jewish culture. Does anyone know what he did? He ran. He was going to run to his shame. So that means he was going to pick up whatever he was wearing. He was going to show his legs and show his ankles, and he was going to run. And that was not something that you did in that culture. I don't care how stupid you think that is. I was going to make a really funny joke, but Jenny told me not to do it. <laughs> And he ran. You run. run. Now, where's that religious older brother? Come on. <laughs> he stayed home. He was sitting there. He was doing the right thing the whole time. He was working for his father. He knew that he was going to have an inheritance, but he was doing what he was supposed to. And then he sees his brother coming. He was mad from the beginning, and he's coming with his brother, and he's just fuming and frustrated inside. Stop smiling. <laughs> right? Oh, we got some rocks. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if he would have threw some rocks and he would have stoned him right then and there, he would have been justified in the eyes of the law and justified in the eyes of those in the community. What about the neighbors that would have saw him coming down the street from far away? Come on, I need a couple more, a couple more Pharisees. Just stand up. Just stand up. Take, take your stones and your swords. Come on, stand up in the back. Now go back there again. We're going to reenact this. Come on, come on, go. Boy, you know what, what, you've seen him cry. You've seen his heart be so saddened that his son had left. And now all of a sudden he's coming. And boy, could you imagine if you saw 
your son and you didn't run to cover him, they're picking up their stones. Go run. Go run. And he covers them. He was basically saying that my son, he's full of shame. He's come back in his embarrassment. But I love him, and I'm going to surround him, and I'm going to wrap him, and I'm going to protect him from everyone that wants to throw stones, everyone that wants to kill him, everyone that wants to point their finger, everyone that wants to destroy them. Because that's what the Father's love is. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. I don't know if I can use you in the, later on in the story with you smiling like that. Yeah? <laughs> See, that, that's the picture of what Jesus did for us, isn't it? The Father loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And what it does is it covers us. Because when we've gone out into the world, and, and hey, maybe you, didn't, you weren't a prodigal son. Maybe you didn't start drinking and doing drugs and you know, messing around and doing all these things. But I'm going to tell you, you were born into sin. It's not your fault, but you were born into sin. And, and as we live our lives, we've all sinned, right? right? We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The perfect standard that we had to measure ourselves against before Christ was the Ten Commandments. All of us have told a lie, right? Yeah. Most of us have stolen something. Most of us have broken a lot of those commandments. If you're guilty of breaking one, you're guilty of breaking them all. So if you stand in front of God on the Day of Judgment and you use the Ten Commandments, you're all guilty, and even though God's a God of love, he's a God of justice, and he'd have to hold you accountable to all of that. He'd have to look at the law and say, you have transgressed the law, and there is a penalty for your sin. It is death. It is eternal death. And I'm going to tell you that whether you are out there in the world living it up, or you try to do the best you can, you still have that crimson stain in your heart that God had to wash and had to cleanse. And so when it is time on that day of judgment and you stand in front of God, it is not your good works. It's not how many less sins you did than your brother across the street. It's if you have sinned, you have fallen short of the glory of God, which means you need forgiveness, right? And I'm telling you, the devil, as you live your life all the way until you die or were raptured, he is going to continually point at you and say, look at what you did. Pete, you're a sinner. Do you remember what you did 20 years ago? Do you remember what you did? Do you remember how you talked to your wife? Do you remember how you acted towards those people? He's constantly berating and pointing and saying, look at, look at, look at what he did. And Jesus is standing there as your advocate saying, you know what? Well, look at what I did. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The, the Jesus went and he died for you and he had this mission. He realized that if he would die and he would be the perfect sacrifice as the lamb on the cross and take all the sin of the world, past, present, and future upon him, that by that, he would make it available through people's faith to have a relationship with him. And, and so Pete, stand up. And, and so here, here's Pete. He's, he's not a perfect man, right? He's a, he's a man just like all of us, except the women. You know, you know. <laughs> we all have sin, right? And the devil would love to point him all the way they can and how he messed up. But Jesus is saying, uh-uh. Yeah. He's forgiven. That's right. He's free. Amen. Amen. He's covering right. us from that, right? And not, and not just what the devil shows in, in, in saying in all of that. It, all the people that have seen you messed up in your life, right? How, how many of you started to get right with the Lord and people are like, I, I know that cat. He's going to go back out and do the same thing. You know what? I'll never let him in my life again. I'll never let her around because she ruined this in my life. Man, she did some people wrong. He did this wrong. Makes me... Right? We, we have all these things that we've done and people always accusing us. That's why it's so important to know what Jesus did for you at the cross. Why it's so important that you know that he covers you by his blood. Right? But I want to tell you, the big brother, boy, he wasn't happy with that, was he? 
Those people, I don't know what they were thinking as they saw this father that was restoring them. He, he said, go bring the sandals, go bring the ring, go bring a robe of righteousness. He was restoring with the ring, he was restoring his, his sonship, so to speak. He was saying, this is still my son. He still has the authority to transact on my name, right? He was saying, he's part of the family. He's not lower than, he's exactly who he was when he left. And through the robe, he said, he puts the robe on, that's something that would... Old servants wouldn't wear robes. They wouldn't wear sandals. And now he's putting the robe on them and putting sandals that shows that he, again, he's part of this family, which is absolutely perfect and wonderful and shows that when we come to Christ, what does he do? He restores us, Amen. right? He gives us the ability to transact on his behalf. You are the hands and the feet of Jesus. You're ambassadors of the kingdom of God, and you are now part of the family. But the thing is, as you walk it out, there are going to be people in your life that are going to continue to remind you of your shame. I've got to ask you this question. Is there someone that you need to cover in your life right now? Is there somebody that you need to continually cover with prayers? But then as they come to the Lord, boy, there's a lot of people that are not going to be happy. Yeah. A lot of people are going to say, you ain't going to make it. Yeah. A lot of people that said, oh, you're not you're one of those uh, Jesus freaks now, are you? And you need to come alongside of them and you need to cover them yeah. and walk with them. Yeah. Husbands, you need to cover your wives. Amen. Tell you what, there's a lot of times that your wives are going to do things that you're going to have to sit there and you're going to have to endure whatever type of ridicule comes from that. And wives, this may seem counterintuitive in, the, in, in authority and so forth, but there's times you're going to have to cover your husbands yeah. and you're going to have to cover your children and they're going to do dumb things yeah. and they may deserve the punishment of it, but you're going to cover them, you're going to protect them. Yeah. It's because you love them. But it's not always easy to love those people that wronged us. There's people that are going to walk through that door at some point. They have gone into the world and they have spent all their inheritance and all they're bringing is shame. Will you walk with them through that restoration process? When people start to say, ha, you know what, I've seen this happen before. I've seen them come to a church and they cry and they do all this and then they're back in the world and a couple months later. Are you willing to cover them and say, not this time? Yeah. Are you willing to walk with them? Are you willing to disciple them? Are you willing to just pray with them? Are you willing to say, I'm available if you need to call? Yeah. I mean, there's always a line, but, but people that are coming out of this world with sin and shame, they need to see Christ. Right. They see it through the Word of God as you read it with them, but they're also going to see it in your example as you walk it out with them. Amen? That's, right. That's how the Father's love works, because there is a lot of people that are going to want to ridicule and want to look at and say, why do they get this? I mean, the older brother is a perfect example. He did the right thing. And look at who's getting celebrated. But Jesus, he tells us very clearly that heaven rejoices when one sinner comes home. See, the father didn't make him earn the forgiveness. He showed his love, grace, and mercy. In the far country, the prodigal learned the meaning of misery. Back home. I'm going to say in the church of God, he discovered the meaning of mercy. Yeah, that's good. Amen? Amen? This is a great illustration of Psalms 103, verse 10. It says, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knew our frame, he remembers that we are dust. So again, as I ask the worship team to come up, consider the father's description of the son's experience. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And this is the spiritual experience of every person that comes home to the Lord. So heaven's rejoicing so should we. Amen? Amen. Well, you're going to have a lot of rough characters come through this. I mean, I was a rough character back in 2006 when I walked through the doors of that church. 
but I'm thankful for someone that would walk through. I'm thankful for a lot of people that would walk with me and through me and see me mess up and see me fumble and see me say stupid things from the pulpit and have to repent. I'm telling you, there's nothing more humble than preaching a message and going back there a few months later and saying, boy, what I said was really wrong. But you know what? People love me through it. Will you walk with people and love them through their mistakes? Because they need mercy. They need love. Would you stand with me? I just ask first and foremost, is there anyone here that has been like that prodigal son? You've gone and you spent everything that you may have at home, or maybe you didn't have much at home, and you're like, i got to get out of this situation, and you went forward and you just saw that the world had nothing more to offer, and you found yourself broken and at the end of yourself and just hungry for something more, something good, something right, and your life had gotten away, and you say, I need to come back home. I need to come to the Lord. I need to give my life to a loving Father. I need to understand this mercy. I need to understand what this grace is. I need, I, I know that my life isn't right, but I know that I've heard Jesus died for me and I want to surrender my life. But I've been afraid. And I've struggled and I wondered if the church would judge me. I wondered if my neighbors would judge me. I wondered what they would say. And you're at that place, you just don't care. You need to get right with the Lord. You need to put it in his hands. Is there anyone here that would be willing to cover someone like that if they came to the altar today? Would you raise your hand? It's one thing that I love about this church. Boy, you walk with people through their goods and through their bads. So I want to extend this invitation. This is an invitation to say, I'm giving this to you, Lord, and I'm asking for help to someone walk with me. If you're like that prodigal and you're saying, I need... I need the love of the Father. Would you come forward today? We want to love you. We want to gather around you. We want to lift up your hands. Is there anyone here that wants to surrender the Lord, the heart to the Lord? Everyone's right with the Lord in their hearts. more opportunity if anyone wants to surrender their life to the Lord today. Come on up. Now as these kids get ready for the school year, they're going to meet a lot of people that are full of all different types of shame. Maybe they come from a family that's full of shame. Maybe they made some mistakes. Maybe they're not sure if they're boys or they're girls in their mind and they're confused. Maybe they're the ones that everyone else is laughing at and pointing at and made made fun of. You know, being part of the preteen group, again, reminds me just how cruel teenagers can be to other teenagers. I want to tell you, young people, that you're going to need to cover some people. If you want to truly be the hands and the feet of Jesus, if you want to share your life and open your life just enough so that they can see the witness of Christ, I'm going to tell you that when these people reach out to you, you may feel like a little bit of that shame yourself as you're talking to them. You may not, but I'm telling you that when I was a kid, I was like a chameleon. I fit in with everyone. But boy, those kids that were ostracized, and I'm not saying it's right, but I'm telling you, I didn't want to really be seen around them. But those, some of those kids have died since I've graduated high school, and I really seriously doubt that they came to know the Lord, came to know Christ. But I could see, I could think back, I could remember when they reached out, when they needed to someone come alongside them. Will you be that this year? Will you look at the outcast and say, I'm willing to reach out? You're not going to get down in that hole with them, but you're going to extend, extend your hand to help them out of that hole. And you may have to cover them. You may have to stand against those that ridicule them. They may be confused. They may sound strange, sound different. They may be embarrassing. Let's just be honest, to be around. But if God puts it in your heart to reach out that way, are you willing? I'm going to ask the young people to come forward. I want to pray for boldness. I want to pray for boldness. I'm going to ask those that want to come alongside them and cover them and lay hands on them.
I'm going to ask for the Lord to give you opportunities, young people. Hey, if you miss one, it doesn't mean you give up. You keep going forward. seen some growth over the last few years in the lives of these young people. I mean, literally, they're a lot taller. But there's a bunch of spiritually hungry, mature people now serving in different aspects, getting up here and preaching the gospel. I mean, it's just the beginning of what God has for you. Would you just extend your hands over these young people? Would you pray as we pray for boldness right now? Father, I come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that as we look at this prodigal son story, we see so many different aspects. We could spend weeks on this and break it down. But, Lord, I believe, first and foremost, that there is a time in which we live. And then we can think back to when the Jesus people in the 70s came forward. They looked different. They they smelled different. People didn't know how to handle them. But those were the people that were hungry for you and needed you. And God, you did a radical, wonderful thing in their lives. And many of them became pastors. And many of them went forward and told people about you, Lord. And it conflicted with the views of the church at the time. And God, you had a revolution that went forward. There were a bunch of Jesus freaks, a bunch of Jesus hippies. But Lord, we have a whole generation that's out there that is looking at what's on TikTok and YouTube and looking at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and all these different venues that the society says that we should be like. And God, it can be so confusing, even to those that are raised in the church. And God, I pray first and foremost that you protect the minds, guard the hearts and minds of every young person in this place in Christ Jesus. But God, as they go forward, Lord, I pray that there be a holy boldness that rises from within them, Lord. I pray, God, as they see people, Lord, you give them discernment of spirits, Lord, that they would realize that sometimes if they're even working against the demonic, Lord, that they would know how to pray. And I pray, God, that you would give them great faith, Lord. I pray that you would open their mouths, Lord. We see in the book of Acts that every time, Lord, that people were filled with the Spirit, their mouths were open, and they prophesied, and they spoke in tongues, and they preached the gospel. There was just a great movement when your Spirit filled these young people. And I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus, would you fill them fresh with your Spirit? Spirit, God? Would they be endued with power from on high? Lord, would they move in the supernatural gifts that we see in 1 Corinthians 12? Lord, would we they move in the fruit that we see that they're supposed to bear, Lord? Most of all, would they move in an agape love, an unconditional love, Lord? And would they not be worried about what their peers say when they are moved by your Spirit to do outside something outside of the norm? And God, Lord, would you anoint their hands right now, Lord, as they go forth, Lord, and lay hands on others? Will people be healed and people be saved? And would they be delivered from demons? And God, would you give them a great wisdom on when to move forward and when to talk and when to hold back until you say it is time, my God. Lord, I thank you, Lord. For many years, I've thought the evangelization of of people was the main goal of the church, and it is a main thing. But Lord, may we provide this place for people to be raised up and discipled. And I see a young group of people Lord, that have been called and have been equipped. And Lord, may they now be deployed in mighty ways to impact their school, God. And may it just be the beginning of all that you have for them in their lives, Lord. And I thank you for the adults that were willing to come and say, for me and my house, we're going to serve you, God. And as they came here, Lord, as they surrendered, God, thank you for the work that you've done in their lives, the healings of marriages and restoration of families, God. And may this continue to be a great witness and example to those in the community and those that see them, Lord. I thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. No matter how far we go, no matter what that far country looks like in our lives, that, God, we can always turn and come home, and you'll run to us, and you'll meet us, and you'll restore us, God. I know there's consequences that we face in the world, but, God, you're a God of restoration and healing. And I thank you, Jesus, that there are so many of us that have returned from that faraway place. And we realize the benefit and the goodness of being here. And God, may we continue just to remind this, the people that we come in contact with of how good it is in your Father's, in the Father's house, in your house, God. Hallelujah.
young people, would you turn around to the adults behind you? I know some of you have no problem laying hands on people, and I love it. You walk anywhere. But I'm going to ask you if you pray for the adults, your parents, that they have wisdom and they have direction as the school year goes forward on how to encourage you. That's hard sometimes to trust God in all of this as we send our kids into sometimes the lines then. Would you pray for them? If you feel led to pray for anyone else in this line or anyone that's sitting down, would you pray for them? Would you pray that they would have boldness? Would you pray that they would have a confidence in the Lord like never before? Maybe some of them are sick and they need prayer for healing. Would you pray that God would heal them right now? We're not just about talking about what you should do. Let's practice those things. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for them. Thank you, God, for the work that you're doing in their lives. I pray for strength and understanding and wisdom. I thank you, God, for how you have worked so far and all that you have.